um, I would like you to I would like to introduce you um, Tom Fitzpatrick uh, he's been interested in food and farming for many years however he did not come from a farming background he perceived that a sector which was quite hard to get into um, but after studying geolo geology at university he completed a seasonal job on a mixed farm in England this position consolidated his love for the food and farming sector and he later found a permanent position in agriculture. Tom Fitzpatrick now is the farm manager at Craigie's Farm, a pick-your-own farm in Scotland, primarily growing strawberries, raspberries, and pumpkins. And with that, I would like to hand over to Tom. Hi, Tom. Hi, uh, um, thanks very much for introducing me and giving me this opportunity to talk today. It's, um, thanks for joining. Great to have a chance to talk about um, planning a sustainable food system, especially um, as we've, we've got people from uh, chefs um, and the supply chain and also farmers. Um, and so just to give you, yeah, a brief overview of who I am and what I do today and where I'm working. Uh, as, as you mentioned, I'm Tom and I work at Craigie's Farm now. Unsurprisingly, most of you have probably never heard of Craigie's Farm. We're based in Scotland, just outside of Edinburgh, which is the capital of Scotland. And we produce um, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, primarily for the pick your own market. Now, the pick your own market is where people come to your farm and pick, pick the fruit as a sort of fun day out, but also a chance to see where their food is growing and um, take some tasty produce home at the end of the day. Um, now, for people who don't know, the UK's climate is very, um, is, uh, is a maritime one. And as a result, we really struggle to grow many different types of fruit that you might be able to grow in the UK. Um, which is why we sort of focus on the soft fruit, the strawberries, the raspberries, as we can grow those in the UK very successfully. Um, now, today we're, we're talking about a sustainable food system. So before I sort of launch into all of my talk, I just wanted to mention what I thought a sustainable farm might look like in a sort of very broad brush way. And I think it's one that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, are we doing that as farmers in the UK? 95% of the time, no, we're not. Um, and why we're not, I'll, I'll go into a minute. Um, so at the moment, our model is, 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 is quite far from a sustainable one. And the reason I think that is we've been we have very, very successfully responded to market forces in the UK and um, the market force over the last 40 years and really post-war, post-Second World War is to produce as much food for as cheaply as possible, um, which we've done. We've intensified our production. We've made it more efficient. Um, we've put more and more inputs into it. So we're now in a position where I think the UK, our food as a proportion of our income is as cheap as it has been historically in the UK, other than the last few years ever. And as a percentage of our income, it's, it's one of the least, it's, it's one of the cheapest places to buy food in the world. So farming has been driven by over the last, yeah, 60 years, I say, producing as much food for as cheaply as possible. And we've become very, very good at that, but at the expense of, of environmental sustainability and farmers' health and um, consumer health too. Now, looking at UK fruit production, um, which, is, which is the sector that I work in, um, and just to give you a sort of overview of what that looks like in the UK, I'll flick through some pictures of our farm just to give you an idea of where many people are from um, the UK here. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's very it's quite tricky to produce most types of fruit in the UK given our climate. And as a result, only 15 to 20 percent of our fruit that is consumed in the UK every year is actually um, 
grown domestically and soft fruit, strawberries, raspberries are an absolute key component of that. Um, and so it is really important to work out how we can make that, how we can make that sector more sustainable. And currently, as you can see in the pictures, it's very intensive. It's largely grown out of the soil. And you can see in this picture, it's all grown in Koya, which is a um, waste product from the coconut industry, uh, primarily in India. Um, and it's grown under plastic and it's all it's irrigated through uh, drip lines, providing the plants with exactly the right pH, exactly the right fertilizer and exactly the amount, right amount of water. So it's very, very intensive, produces large yields per hectare, um, which is a good thing because we're using small amounts of land to produce large quantities of food, which largely goes to the local um, population. However, all of our fertilizers are synthetic, most of which comes from, if not all of it, I think actually comes from outside of the UK, mined or produced using um, petrochemicals. So that's sort of how we grow at the moment. And um, another, a big part of, as, as, as farmers here will know, a big part of, of growing is pest diseases. Um, and, and much of that, especially in soft fruit, is, is still controlled chemically, uh, although there are many improvements in that over the last 20 years. And um, who do we supply as a farm? Well, it's, this is where we are really good for the sustainability because we're producing a local food for local people. Um, as we're an agritourism business, we're trying to promote our food to the people who live an hour, hour and a half drive from, uh, from where we are, which we're lucky because it's about half of Scotland's population live within that distance. And so people come to pick the fruit and it's all consumed locally. So that's, that's a really good part, uh, of, uh, of what we do. Um, so sort of I had a quick look at the sustainable development goals before this this talk just to see where we are doing well in Craigie's and where there is room for improvement and from an education perspective we're doing quite well it's an opportunity for people to come and look at the food to see where their food is grown and go away with a slightly more awareness of of where their food is grown and hopefully through that would encourage people to vote for policies or vote for governments that might improve our food system and make it more sustainable. <coughs> Sorry, we also produce good quality food for a local population, which is a massive tick and sort of as a farmer, that's my main, I feel that's my main job is, is to produce good quality local food for local people. And hopefully too, we produce decent, uh, we provide decent work um, in a good work environment. So there's, there's many positives of what we do um but just to look at at, at at where we can improve improve and how we might be able to improve um at the moment the sort of the main problem that i see is it's is far from a local or circular supply chain so to look for a second where all of our um supplies come from the coya as I say, comes which is the, the medium in which the strawberries and raspberries grow. That comes from Kerala in India. It's shipped across the world to uh, get to where we are. The, um, the fertilizer that comes from across the world, the plants that you can see in this picture, they come from the Netherlands so that we can then grow the strawberries. So it's a very disparate supply chain and then at the end of it all none of the the choir or the the plant material goes in to next year's crop it all just gets composted and then uh, spread onto other fields to avoid risk of moving disease around now the other area for improvement within the soft fruit is often it it involves very high levels of tech and that makes it very hard for smaller growers like us to actually um, continue. And, and we're seeing in the UK a huge consolidation at the moment of 
horticultural businesses moving, getting conglomerated together and moved into bigger ones just because of those huge barriers to entry. Now, what do I imagine is a more sustainable fruit farming future? This first point, less reliance on synthetic fertilizer is something I've talked about briefly with um, Effie. And it is going to have to be addressed um, as we know how polluting synthetic fertilizers are. Um, and also a lot of that synthetic fertilizer at the moment within soft fruit is just run to waste at about 20% of the fertilizer is and that's just the nature without going into too much detail that's the nature of of growing it you have to keep washing the bags out otherwise the fertilizer gets stuck in the bag and it's very bad for the plant that way so it'd be great to have more affordable and practical solutions for recycling those nutrients on the farm rather than just letting them run out of the bottom of the bag and into the local environment. These kind of lead me to question whether a really intensive system is the best way to grow our food or whether a more extensive and lower input system um, like is seen in, like seen in many parts of the world is potentially a bit of a better, a bit of a better way to produce our food. Um, and that leads me to the end of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I think we ran into some technical challenges with the second speaker, so uh, we will just uh, go straight to the panel session a little earlier. Um, yeah. So, so I suppose I can just uh, start uh, with a question as well. Um, like, since you are working quite in the like, uh, fruit uh, production, uh, area um, within the UK and just la last night at least here in Scotland there was quite heavy rain um, after a long long, long drought well, yeah. how do you think uh, it's best to plan for unforeseeable events and disruptions in food supply chain like especially like fruit production as well yes um, climate change has well I guess it's really hard to say whether specific weather events are actually associated with climate change or not. However, anecdotally speaking to older people in and around Edinburgh who are also involved in farming, the weather is becoming less reliable here than it was. Um, whether that's due to human induced climate change, we could we could debate until the end of cows come out. I happen to think it probably is. Um, and it, it makes farming much, much harder, um, even in a place like Scotland, where it is it, well, it's in the central part of Scotland, where it is quite easy to grow food um, compared to many parts of the world. Um, so as an example, yeah, the last six months in Scotland, usually we'd expect a nice spring with a bit of rain, followed by a bit of sun, followed by a bit of rain. And then the summer, you get a lot more sun and then occasionally occasional bits of rain, whereas the spring's just been damp and cold, which means makes it quite hard to grow strawberries. They just don't really grow that fast at all. And they're much more um, susceptible to things like botrytis and powdery mildew, which are both uh, fungal diseases. And then we've had a period of dry and hot weather, which makes all we try and space our crops out. So we get a slow production of strawberries through the through the year, um, no, uh, through the summer, sorry, and it just compresses it all, so you get it, you get a big glut. So that's what we're trying yeah. to deal with at the moment is trying to work out how we can space our crops out more. But you can only do what the weather allows you to do. So, yeah, so in a sense, I would uh, imagine you are trying to plan ahead uh, for kind of like weather events that, let's say, were um, not usual like, like uh, five years ago are more likely to happen in nowadays or in the future. But I think last year it was uh, quite a heat wave in the summer as well that was unheard of in the whole of UK. Yeah, no, absolutely. So um, I know farmers down south um, that when they were upscaling their farm 20 years ago, 
um, built in reservoirs that they thought were plenty big enough for their irrigation requirements during the summer. And now they're looking at, well, how do we increase our, our ponds? We never thought we would need to use this much water during the summer. Or they're finding the ponds they have dug and assumed would be filled up through the winter just aren't even half full, which then has big implications of what you can grow in the summer. Um, so, yeah, water availability is going to become a bigger and bigger issue. Either you've got too much of it in the wrong place or you've got too little bit in the wrong place. Yes, indeed. So, yeah, I guess uh, yeah, it sort of answers as well, like uh, how proactive plumbing could aid um, with yeah, achieving sustainable full system. Like, I mean, within the UK at least. Um, but also on the demand side, uh, how are you trying to like, um, or how are you managing to cope with uh, uneven demand? Um, we're quite lucky on the farm because we have more demand for our fruit than we have fruit um, because we fulfill that niche, pick your own market. And as a fallout from COVID, we have a ticketing system. So mm -hmm. at the beginning of the, you can only come and pick fruit at Craigie's if you've got a ticket, especially on the popular weekends and stuff, a day like today, where it's the middle of the week, you can just turn up and pick fruit. Mm -hmm. But when it's popular, you have to come with a ticket. So that means that at the beginning of the day, we can see how much fruit there is on the farm. Or at the beginning of the week, we can see how much fruit there's on the farm. And then we sort of release tickets based on how much fruit we think we can sell. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of like an advanced ticketing uh, system. Exactly. So we're very lucky in that we can, we can temper our demand and increase our demand based on how much supply that we have. Yeah. So we're very lucky in that perspective and we can either release more tickets or reduce the number of tickets that are available. And generally speaking, famous last words, we sell all of our tickets. Um, especially during the summer when it's school holiday. So this like this time is a bit harder mm -hmm. because schools aren't on holiday in Scotland just yet. But mm -hmm. next, the end of this week, the schools are on holiday. It was at the end of next week. Um, and then it will be much easier to sort of fill all of our slots um, and, 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 and reduce any food waste that way. Yeah, so we're very lucky in that regard. Yeah, it does sound uh, pretty neat. Like You can uh, connect it that way and uh, essentially control um, the supply uh, and the demand side of things, even it out better, especially yeah, because it, it certainly helps. I would imagine with uh, like not 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 really having uh, um, losses uh, at harvest level, like even fruits going bad um, before they get harvested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, also, yeah, it's okay. I think uh, since uh, you are the only one on the panel now. <laughs> Um, sort of last question, I think. Like, what one piece of advice do you think would have the biggest impact for people looking to live more sustainably? That's a quite broad question. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can only really give that perspective from a from a from a British perspective because that's mm -hmm. where I've been born and brought up. Um, I think we've got to be content with being happy with less, uh, with less physical stuff. And we can't constantly desire to have more and more and more because that's just not sustainable. So yeah, being happy, being, finding happiness with, le well, not finding happiness, finding contentment with, with having less stuff. Yeah, well said, well said. I think oftentimes nowadays there's always a rush to get more things, um, consume more, even though we might have uh, everything we already need, or we already have everything we need, really. Yeah, yeah. and buy good quality food. I'm not, yes, I'm not exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, I see uh, actually, yeah, the uh, second speaker did manage to join, so. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 